be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond the ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Craig. So glad to have you here. Those of you watching online, thanks for tuning in. You know, we've all come here today from different places, different spaces, different backgrounds, different life circumstances, different stages of life. There's a lot that's different between all of us here today. But I want to suggest that there's something that we also all share in common. I believe every one of us walked into this room today with a need for healing in some area of our life. And I just wonder if you could ask God for healing in any area of your life today, and you knew it would be granted, you knew you would leave here today with complete healing in that area, what would that area be for you? For some of you, you'd probably ask for emotional healing. Maybe a lot of us would ask for that with the week that we've just been through and thinking about the unspeakable, horrible tragedy in Uvalde. And that coming right on the heels of just several weeks back, the unspeakable, horrible tragedy in Buffalo, New York. I sat across from a black brother in Christ right after that happened who uh, was just brokenhearted and grieving like we're all grieving, but I realized broken in a way that maybe I as a white person can't fully understand. And he, he said, I'm just so weary. I'm just weary of the tension and the injustice and um, the violence, the racial violence in our world. I think he would probably be praying for emotional healing. Uh, maybe you would around issues like battling anxiety and depression and addiction and fear. Others of you might be asking for financial healing. Uh, just to be free from the worry and stress of your financial burdens. I had lunch with a friend last week who at one point was making more money than he knew what to do with and now finds himself out of a job and starting a whole new venture at a later stage in life, still has a family to support. And at the end of that meal, he said, Craig, I'll just tell you, I'm kind of scared about all of this. I think he, like some of you, would be praying for financial healing. Some of you might be asking for physical healing that you or someone you love has received a diagnosis, an illness, a uh, disease that you know you weren't made to live with in this world, that as image bearers of God, uh, we, our bodies weren't made to live with sickness and illness, and yet we live in a fallen world. It's part of the world that we find ourselves in. Kathy and I and some friends sat around in a living room not too long ago praying for some close friends whose grandson had recently received a diagnosis, his precious child who received um, some news that points to a lifetime of uncertainty, a curveball they didn't see coming. And I know today how hard they're praying, how hard we're all praying for his physical healing. Perhaps you would ask for relational healing, that there are wounds that other people have inflicted on you from your past. It's just hard to let go of. Now you find yourself stuck with a little bit of anger and bitterness and lack of forgiveness Maybe it's that child that's turned away, walked away, going down a path that you know is not going to end well, and you try to talk to them, but they don't want to listen. They don't want to really have anything to do with you. And so you desperately cry out for relational healing. 
And I know there are some sitting here today who this journey has been so long, the pain has become so intense, the wounds are so overwhelming that you're beginning to lose hope. You're not sure if healing is even possible. Maybe you showed up here today out of desperation and you're saying to God, deep in your soul, God, I'm giving you one last chance. I'm giving you one more shot. I'm showing up. I need you to show up. I need some healing in my life. And I hope this message encourages you today. Because I want everyone to leave here today knowing that you have a God who loves you and who sees you and who understands your pain and who wants what's best for you and will ultimately bring healing to your life. We believe in the healing power of our God here at IBC. We're in this series entitled The Story of Life where we're looking at the life of Jesus and learning from it, trying to live the life that he's promised us. And it's not just life after death, it's an abundant life right now. And so how do we learn from him? How do we follow in his ways? And today, we're gonna consider Jesus as our wounded healer and what that means for us. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn in Luke chapter seven, we're gonna begin in verse 11. This is right after he's preached his famous Sermon on the Mount. And then it says, shortly afterwards, Jesus left on a journey to the village of Nain with a massive crowd of people following him and his disciples. And as he approached the village, he met a multitude of people in a funeral procession who were mourning as they carried the body of a young man to the cemetery. And the body was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. I want you to picture the scene here. Uh, Jesus was walking up on this funeral procession, a little bit different than it would look today. Today we see policemen, you know, leading, lights blinking, intersections closed. But back then it says there were a multitude of people. There were these mourners. There was these friends of this woman who had lost her son. But there were probably also some professional mourners. It wasn't uncommon in this day to pay people to come along and mourn, to bring some instruments, some tambourines, some flutes. uh, And they would wail in sadness in response to this great loss. Um, And so Jesus walks up on this very emotional scene. And there's a lot we don't know in this scene. We don't know how old this mom is. She could be in her late teens. She could be in her late 30s. We don't know how she became a widow. Did her husband die from an accident? Did he die from an illness? We don't know. We don't know how old the son is. He could be three months old, five years old, 13 years old. There's a lot we don't know. But what we do know is this woman has already suffered the loss of her husband. And now she's lost her only son. She must be overwhelmed with grief at her deepest moment of pain. You talk about longing for some healing. And then in verse 13, I love how this begins, when the Lord saw her. The Lord saw her. Jesus saw her. And it's interesting, over 40 times in the New Testament, it says Jesus saw somebody. And I think, of course he did. He's God. He sees everybody, doesn't he? And yet I think there's something different the author wants us to see here that Jesus really saw her. He noticed her. Because don't you know there's a difference between just kind of seeing somebody and really seeing somebody, really noticing someone. My wife will tell you, I'm not great at really seeing things. I kind of see things, but not really see things. Not too long ago, she, it was a Saturday, we had a date night planned, and she went that afternoon to go get her hair done. And so she left the house, and it got close to time that it was supposed, we were supposed to be leaving on our date. And she still wasn't back. And so I was dressed, I was ready, I was getting a little bit frustrated and I hear the garage door go up. And before I finish the story, in my defense, I wanna tell you, sometimes she goes and just gets her hair cut and comes home and washes it and styles it herself. And sometimes she has them do that there. Okay, so now I'll finish the story. She walks in and I notice, I look, I don't really notice. And I said, okay, we're running late. Our reservation is in 10 minutes. You don't have time to fix your hair. You're gonna have to go with it as is. <laughs> Not my best husband moment. Uh, we'll say the date night was a bust, okay? But uh, so uh, the reason she was late is because she had stayed for them to fix her hair for our date night. So now I just kind of randomly every once in a while say, hey, your hair looks great. Have you done something different to it? I actually have a friend though, I think is a little bit of a worse story. In the first years of his marriage, him and his uh, young wife went to Crystal's Pizza over in Irving on 183 for a date night. Um, If you're not familiar with that place, it's kind of the precursor to CC's Pizza and it was kind of a big warehouse type thing with different rooms and things going on. And so the way it worked is if you were there, you walked in and you kind of stayed in a line around the wall and then you ordered and then you sat down and got your pizza. 
And so they come in and they're on their date night and they're visiting in the line all the way around the wall. I'm sure 20, 30 minutes of visiting. They get to the thing, they order their pizza, interact with the person behind the counter. They get their number. They go sit at their table. Now they're at a booth face-to-face talking to each other. 10 minutes into the conversation, the husband says, "Uh uh-oh, I think you're going to be upset with me. And he says, I mean, she says, why? What's the matter? And he says, well, I just now noticed you have this big pink sponge roller on the very front of your head. (laughs) Yeah, they got up and left immediately, didn't wait for the pizza. I'm pretty sure that date night was a bust as well. But Jesus here, he really sees this mom. He takes notice. And you should know that he really sees you here this morning. He notices. Peter says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. God knows what you're going through this morning. He sees, but he doesn't just see. He all, look what it says next. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. There wasn't enough room in his heart for the compassion that he felt. This word that's translated compassion here is the Greek word splagna. And it kind of means what it sounds like. Splagna, it just comes from the very depth of your bowels. There's no stronger word in the Greek language for compassion. It's feeling, it's, it's not just sympathy, but it's an empathy with a desire to do something about it. Frederick Buechner defines it as that fatal capacity for feeling what it's like to live in someone else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there's peace and joy finally for you too. Jesus saw her pain and it affected him. He felt it in his gut and he cared. Most scholars think he had already lost his earthly dad by this point. So perhaps he was remembering the pain of what it's like to lose a dad as he had watched his mom suffer the grief of losing her husband, knowing that death was never the intention when he created human beings. And I just think somebody here today needs to hear that the Lord your God knows what you're going through. And he cares more than you could ever imagine. He sees your pain. He hears the cries of your heart. He knows when you feel desperate, when you can hardly catch your breath, when you lay awake at night staring at the ceiling with your heart racing. Jesus knows that feeling when you're praying for your marriage, when you don't know where the next paycheck's coming from, when you feel anxious or frustrated or afraid, the Lord sees you and he notices and he cares and he sees this grieving single mom and he says, please don't cry. And then he stepped up to the coffin and he touched it. This would have been scandalous at the time, shocking to the people watching. This was unheard of because the religious elite had all of these rules and regulations. And one of the big one was, you don't touch a dead anything. And you don't touch anything that's touched a dead anything. And you don't touch anything that's touched anything that's touched a dead anything. Because if you do, then you're unclean. And so when Jesus touches this coffin, he crosses a line But we've already seen a couple weeks ago that Jesus is a boundary breaker. He is a line crosser because that's what love does. And so he touches the coffin, perhaps even touches the boy, because no boundaries, no rules, no laws can keep Jesus from expressing his compassion to those people that he loves that are hurting. Then it says, when the pallbearers came to a halt, Jesus spoke directly to the corpse. Young man, I say to you, arise and live And the Greek word translated here is egero. It is just one word, egero, arise. It means to restore from a dead or damaged state, to heal. Jesus heals this young boy with just one word, egero, arise. And I don't know what that dead thing is in your life today, your damaged state that needs to be restored, that if you were to dare believe that Jesus could heal something in your life right now, that this is the area, this is the situation, Jesus, I need you to speak, to command Egero, because I need it to come back to life. I need it restored. I need healing. Because whatever feels dead in your life right now, with one word, Jesus can bring it back. Immediately, it says, immediately, the young man moved He sat up. He spoke to those nearby. Jesus presented the son to his mother alive. A tremendous sense of holy mystery swept over the crowd. They shouted praises to God saying, God himself has blessed us by visiting his people. A great prophet has appeared among us. The Lord saw her and he cared for her and he spoke. And it's hard to describe what this would have meant for this grieving widow because moments before she had nothing Not only had she lost the one person she loved the most, but she couldn't support herself in that culture without a husband or a son. 
Her life was for all practical purposes over and Jesus saw her and he speaks and his son, her son comes back to life and Jesus carries the boy to this single mom and not only does he give her her son back, but he gives her her life back. He gives her her hope back and that's my prayer for some of you this morning that if you're here and you are feeling hopeless, you're feeling afraid or anxious or bitter or on guard that with one word, Jesus can give you your hope back today. That he can speak egero to that emotional wound, to that financial wound, to that relational wound, to that physical wound. This story shows us healing is possible with Jesus. If he can speak and a dead boy sits up and lives, then he can speak life over your situation. And we can live with hope knowing that Jesus heals and ultimately brings healing to all situations. And I know when I say that, some of you are going to push back and you're going to say, but Craig, I, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and Jesus hasn't healed. Why didn't he heal my mom when she died from cancer? Why didn't he heal my marriage? Why hasn't he healed my friend's grandchild? We've been praying. And look, I don't know why God doesn't do what I want, when I want, how I want, but I know that if he did, I'd be God in that scenario. And God, the Bible says God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. Paul, one of our greatest heroes of the faith, wrote most of the New Testament, prayed three times to God, would you remove this specific pain in my life? And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, God, because God sees a bigger picture. And even over in the great hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, where it just lists all the great saints of our faith and all of their accomplishments, at the end of it in verse 39, it says this, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind. So I just have to trust, knowing that God could speak a word at any moment. And so if he hasn't, he must have something better in mind. And I know that even if it's never fully restored on this side of eternity, there is a day coming, Revelation 21 says, when he will wipe away every tear and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of those things will be gone forever. Healing is on its way. And Jesus will ultimately heal every wound that you have right now and every wound you've had in your past and every wound you have in your future. You can count on it. But in the meantime, you can take comfort in knowing that his heart overflows with compassion for what you're going through because he understands. He knows it because he has the scars to prove it. He is our wounded healer, which defies any explanation. No other religion can quite get its mind around the fact that we serve a God who was wounded for us. Peter says it this way, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And here's what that means. God is not distant from your pain. He's entered into it with you. He's, he was willing to have his own body wounded and broken and buried for us so that we could ultimately be healed. And one of the most remarkable passages in all of the New Testament is when Jesus, after his resurrection, shows up to his disciples. And you remember there's this one guy who's having a hard time with the whole thing. His name is Thomas. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. And Jesus is just so gracious with him, so kind with him. And he says, hey, Thomas, put your hands in my scars. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, Craig, this is after Jesus' resurrection? I thought he had his perfected body now. I thought this was the body he was taking into eternity. Why are there scars there? What are scars doing in a perfect heaven? Well, could it be that scars are not imperfections? Because here's the thing about scars. Scars don't tell the story of your wounding. I have a scar here on my thumb that I've had since I was a little kid, and you can't look at it and say, oh yeah, I know the story behind that scar, unless I tell you. And so I'll tell you. When I was a little kid, uh, my parents on a July 4th weekend took me and my older sister and my oldest brother to a beach by a lake with a bag of fireworks and let us out of the car to go play with all the other kids without their parents. I don't know what parents were thinking in the 1960s, right? So go have fun, kids. And I have some bottle rockets and a puck, and I'm looking for my older brother because he has tormented me my entire life. And I thought, this is my moment. I'm gonna shoot these bottle rockets at him. And so I'm looking around the beach for him, and I've got my puck in my left hand, I've got my bottle rockets in my right hand, and I don't notice that the puck has lit the bottle rockets. 
And so it explodes in my hand. I nearly lost my thumb. So now here's this scar to remind me to be kinder to my brother. <laughs> but you would not know that story from looking at my scar because scars don't tell the story of our wounding. Scars tell the story of our healing. It tells me that whatever happened to cause the scar has now been healed, that there's a story of redemption here. And it's the same is true in the spiritual realm. The story of a God, uh, Jesus' scars, they tell a story. The story of a God who so loved this world that he gave his only son and that this son came and lived among us so that he could understand the pain that we go through. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus experienced the anguish of emotional pain to the point that he was sweating blood. So for the woman who wipes a tear off the divorce papers, for the parent who has to pick out a casket, for the person who walks into the restaurant and once again says, table for one, Jesus says, believe me, I know how you feel. He understands your emotional pain. He knows your relational pain. He spent three years of his life investing in his disciples, leading them and loving them. And they were his closest earthly friends. And then in the hour of his greatest need, in the span of one single evening, all of them abandoned him to go save their own skin. One of his closest friends denied that he ever even knew him. So for the child who's left alone to play at recess, for the husband who finds a note on the nightstand that says it's over, for the daughter who stays up late waiting for her dad to call because it's her birthday. Jesus says, I know how you feel. And Jesus knows the agony of physical pain. Beat by a Roman scourging almost to the point of death, humiliated, spat on, nails driven through his hands and feet, pinned to a cross until his lungs collapsed and he died. And do you remember what he had just prayed? He had prayed the same prayer most of us pray. God, if it's possible, will you let this cup pass by me? Will you let me bypass this pain? God, I don't wanna go through that chemo. God, I don't wanna have to put my parents in hospice. God, I don't want my child to have to go through that. And God was silent and Jesus died. And it felt like hope was gone and everything was over. But we know that's not the end of the story. God had something better in mind. And so three days later, a voice booms out of heaven. Egero, arise, live. And Jesus stepped out of that grave. And the power of sin and pain and death was finally and completely destroyed. The scars on Jesus' hands, they tell a story. The story of a God who understands our pain. And his heart overflows with compassion. And he was compelled to move into our mess I hear people say, why doesn't God do something? He did. He gave his only son. And because he conquered death and rose victoriously from the grave, healing is now available to all of us who put our trust in him. Jesus is our wounded healer. And now we're called to be wounded healers. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. We get to participate in the healing work of our God. And so I just wanna close by giving you a couple of suggestions about how we can do that. And the first one is this, share your wounds. Share your wounds. Henry Nouwen in his classic book, The Wounded Healer says this, nobody escapes being wounded. We're all wounded people. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, the main question is not how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. Jesus was God's wounded healer. Through his wounds, we are healed. Jesus' suffering and death brought joy and life. His humiliation brought glory. His rejection brought a community of love. And as followers of Jesus, we can also allow our wounds to bring healing to others. We all have wounds, but our tendency is to want to cover them up. We're embarrassed. We're afraid to let people see our weaknesses. Don't cover them up. Share your story. There are people in this auditorium that need to hear from your, about your wounds so that they don't feel alone. People connect with your weaknesses, not your strengths. Look, I hear Henry Nouwen's words, wounds and humiliation and rejection, and I think, 
Well, he's talking about my middle school and high school years. That's my story. I was a kid in middle school wearing Sears brand Husky size jeans. Who came up with the, the label Husky size? That is not an ego booster for a young child, okay? And so I was chubby, I was unathletic, I was acne ridden, I was a dork. My biggest fear was to get up in front of a class and have to speak because I knew there was a good chance I was gonna get made fun of. And here I am 45 years later and I get to be up here speaking in front of you. I mean, talk about the a miracle and the humor of our God. That some 30 years ago, at a different church, a pastor came to my wife, Kathy, and said, hey, would you and Craig like to teach a young marrieds class? And I know they were asking her because she's beautiful, she's outgoing, she's gregarious, she's smart, and I'm sure it was just like, I guess we have to ask Craig too if we're asking her. So <laughs> can y'all do that? And she said yes, without even checking with me. And again, I'm terrified to speak in front of people at this point, and so she comes and says, hey, I just committed this for a year. Don't worry about it. So uh, I study, I sweat. She doesn't even look, I don't think she even studied more than five minutes. She's like, this will be easy. We're just gonna get up and talk. So I get up, I do my half in the class. She gets up and she just freezes. And all of a sudden she sits back down and we get in the car on the way home and she says, I'll never do that again. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean you'll never do that again? You committed us for a year to do this. And she said, I know, I'm sorry, but I can't do that again. <laughs> so I had to get back up the next week by myself. And the only thing I knew to talk about was my life and how God was working in it. And I was kind of a mess as a husband and as a dad. So that's what I talked about. This was basically my outline every week. Here's the mess that I've made. And here's how God has used it or got me through it. And we get to the end of the, the year and somehow they ask me back the next year. And then they ask me back the next year. And now for 30 years, I've been able to teach a class. And now I get to come up here sometimes and do it. And my outline's still the same. I'm a mess. And here's what God has done. Here's how God has used that. And I'm not the most eloquent speaker that stands on this stage. I'm not the deepest theologian. And, and sometimes I say the wrong thing or I say it the wrong way and it ends up offending some people. And trust me, I never mean to do that. But if I do, I'll give you a peek behind the curtain of what happens when that happens. If I do that in the nine o'clock service, uh, my friend and our beloved executive pastor, Brian Eck, will come find me. And he will pull me aside. And he, hey, Craig, can I talk to you? Yeah, what, do, what you need? And... <laughs> He'll come in and he'll say, hey, you can't say that from the pulpit. <laughs> and, and now it's happened so many times, I don't wait for him to come find me. I just go looking for him. What, what did I mess up? What do I need to change? And yes, it's embarrassing. And usually I think, I can't go back out there at 1045. I'll never do this again. But you know what gets me back up here? Because I know in spite of me and my weaknesses and my missteps, I'm gonna get to speak the name of Jesus and no matter how badly I mess this thing up and how much I embarrass myself in the process, as long as I have left you with Jesus, I've left you with everything that you need because God's grace is enough. And somehow God's been able to use that. And so many of you have been kind and you've come up and said things like, I can't believe you shared that story. <laughs> hey, but thanks, because now I know I'm not the only one. And it frees people up to be just who God made them to be. And I think it brings a sense of hope. Share your wounds. Jesus doesn't need your strengths. He's perfect. He's stronger than your strongest strength. He needs your weaknesses. I heard a preacher say once, the reason God needs your weakness is because it's the one thing that he doesn't have. His power is made perfect, he says, in your weakness. Share your wounds. And then the second thing that I'll close with is point people to the healer. Point them to the healer. Speak the name of Jesus. Tell others what Jesus has done. How the scars you carry today represent the healing that's taken place only because of Jesus. That as you look over your past, you have a story, a testimony to the faithfulness of our God that other people need to hear. That there's hope because there's power in the name of Jesus. Scripture says there is one name under whom all authority has been given. There is a name above all other names and it's the name of Jesus and so to my friend who is weary over racial tensions in our country, I speak the name Jesus, Jehovah Shalom. Only he can bring peace where strife and conflict reign. To my friend who's a little scared over financial situations, I speak the name Jesus, Jehovah Jireh. Our God will provide. To our friends whose grandson has a difficult diagnosis, I speak the name Jesus, Jehovah Rapha. 
because he is the God of healing. The same God who personally handed back a once dead son to his grieving mother, alive, is still in the business of bringing dead things back to life, of bringing sick things back to health, of putting broken things back together. Healing is possible for you today, for your family, for our nation, but it only comes through the person of Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't come as quick as you want or in the way that you want, then I just have to believe, I have to trust, I think I know that he must have something better in mind because he loves you and he sees you and he grieves with you. He feels your pain and he wants what's best for you and he has the power to bring healing. So can we walk out of this place today ready to speak the name of Jesus for our city, over our families, in our workplaces, for our nation, over every heart and every mind because his name is power and his name is healing and his name is is life. And now we come together as a family and we get to celebrate the life that he lived and the life that he gave. So if you have your communion elements, if you will grab those now. Because the night that he was betrayed, he sat around a table with his friends. And he took some bread and he blessed it and he said, this represents my body that was wounded. It'll be broken for you. Take this and remember me. And then in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this represents my blood shed for you. To remind you of the new covenant, the promise that healing is on its way that one day there will be no more death or sorrow or pain and we'll live together forever. Drink this and remember me. Now, as we continue in our worship, the altar will be open. You know, we started by saying, if you could ask God for healing in any area, I wanna tell you, you can. He's here in our midst. You can do it from your seat. You can come up here to the altar with your wounds and lay them before him. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come down. They would love to pray for healing for you or for any other need that you might have. If you've never fully put your trust in Jesus, this could be your morning to do that. They would love to walk you through that and pray with you over that where you could walk out with the ultimate healing. But this is our time to come and respond to him. Um, let's do that now.